Thank you for joining me for the fourth episode of the Doc Talk with Liz podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Garija Kemal, who is an art therapist at, and professor at Drexel University. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. And today, our guest star is Dr. Garija Kamal from, and she is a prof professor at Drexel University, an art therapist, assistant dean for special research initiatives, and the president elect of the American Art Therapy Association. So, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yes, of course. So I just want to kind of start off, if you could just kind of tell us about your journey into art therapy, what got you interested, uh, when you decided this is what you wanted to do as a career, um, and then kind of your journey to where you are now. So where did you go to undergrad, research you did, your role models, just anything that you can kind of tell us about what led you to where you are now? Right. So my journey sort of begins in India. I actually... Not, not even India, Nepal. I was uh, born in Nepal. I was raised in India. And, um, you know, I'm very much shaped, I feel, by two countries. You know, one is India and the other is the US because I've spent sort of half my life in India and then the other half so far in the US, um, which means that I'm very much defined by um, a pragmatic perspective and a desire to do work in the world that um, improves the lives of those around us and those who might not have many of the privileges that some of us uh, have. So recognizing injustices, recognizing disparities in societies and um, how we might as human beings help each other. And this has manifested in different ways. So my first uh, degree, my undergraduate degree was in design. And I worked in um, many rural communities in India, helping craftspeople adapt their skills to global markets. So one of the sort of unfortunate effects of globalization was that um, many sort of traditional fine uh, craft skills didn't have a market as uh, cheap goods you know, cheap um, synthetic goods would flood the market. So this was an effort to both preserve a very fine historic tradition as well as support the mental health and well-being of the communities that um, did this work. Um, even though I sort of enjoyed my life as a designer, there was a part of me that felt very unfulfilled. And that part was uh, the part that's interested in human psychology and uh, human functioning, motivations, that whole piece. So um, when I discovered the field of art therapy in the late 90s, I felt like it really brought together my interests in the arts as well as uh, human functioning. So art therapy um, um, brought together um, how we could use the arts, not just as a form of entertainment or enjoyment, but as a form of promoting health and well-being. So I've been a lifelong artist. I've kind of lived it um, inadvertently. You know, I used to be a very sickly kid. I used to be home a lot when I was in kindergarten and um, nursery school because I was sick. And um, drawing was a way for me to communicate and to... Um, kind of manage my time, manage myself. And it's been this sort of lifelong friend for me. So I've always been an artist. It's just foregrounded or backgrounded depending on what my professional life was. Um, I've used art uh, you know, to make sense of the world when I'm confused about something or distressed about something, uh, but also to process and understand confusing emotions or difficult emotions. So both as a cognitive tool to make sense and to think through things, but and also as an expressive tool to uh, to kind of externalize um, um, negative emotions, uh, if you will. So as I was doing um, my master's in art therapy, you know, I worked in a range of clinical settings in an HIV AIDS clinic, in an inpatient psychiatric unit, in an alternative school, and I've also done workshops in India for. Um, um, 
as part of sort of HR initiatives and things like that. And even though I loved all the human interaction part of it, the clinical part of it, um, there was a part of me that was more and more intrigued by the questions, right? Like, what is the role of art in our lives? Why does any of this matter? Why are we drawn as human beings to creative expression? And this has existed for thousands of years, as long as civilization has existed. You know, cave paintings have developed in many different parts of the world spontaneously when we know these communities did not interact with each other. So there's something really innate and uh, um, human to be interested and to engage in the arts. So uh, these questions led me to some of what I do now, which is less clinical work and more sort of examination of what is the role of creative expression in our life? And I do a lot of research around this, um, both with relatively healthy populations, as well as those who might have been through uh, trauma, like military service members, um, as well as medical patients who've been through cancer care and those who care for them. Um, so that's where I am now. Awesome. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, that does. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm also oh. wondering like about some of your kind of findings from your research and research that you've mm -hmm. done and um, you know how that applies to kind of what you're talking about with like trauma and these things and then how people can kind of incorporate art into their everyday lives as a kind of therapeutic method for healing or just for expression. Yeah, yeah so I think one of and I say this a lot, is that one of the unfortunate side effects of modern society is that we've differentiated professions, right? Like you do this and I'll do that. And um, if I have decided, or if I've got messages through my school years that I'm not good at something, I stop doing it, right? Whether or not that is the appropriate choice. So for a lot of adults, by the time they are 11 or 12 years old, and sometimes even earlier, you get messages about what you're good at, right? If you're good at math or science, or you're good at writing, or you're good at art, or you're good at sports, um, focus on what you're good at and let go of the things you're not good at. Unfortunately, in our effort to specialize and in our effort to professionalize and prepare ourselves to be some kind of professional in the world, we let go of things that might be helpful for us, right? So being able to express yourself in a range of ways is actually deeply and tremendously helpful. And the value of the arts is that they can capture a range of um, human experience in a way that words alone might not. And that's one of the sort of benefits of creative expression is that so much of our sensory perception is not verbal, right? We see, sense, taste, touch, and we need ways to communicate that and words alone are not enough. So we need metaphorical ways to communicate. We need metaphorical ways to express ourselves and that's what the arts do. And I encourage whoever is willing to listen to me to examine things that you enjoyed when you were a kid. You know, what did you enjoy doing? Go back to that. Um, were you a tinkerer? Were you someone who liked to work with fabrics? Or were you someone who liked to move and dance? Were you someone who liked music? Were you someone who liked poetry? All these are metaphorical ways to express ourselves and we need that. We need that to feel like we belong in this world and we, and we are part of this sort of human community. So, um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm also wondering, um, like, what do you do to kind of, you know, if you're stressed out or you need a break or something, what do you, you kind of do? Like, how do you, um, kind of incorporate the arts into your lives with, um, like outside of your research? kind mm -hmm. of, like drawing, painting. Yeah, so you see my wall. Yes. <laughs> um, I always have um, one or more art projects going on. Um, I also doodle a lot. So I have my little handy notebook, which is which always travels with me. 
uh, in which I'll you know note down ideas. Uh, um, I'm working on a book right now, so you know things I need to include in the book, um, different work commitments, things I need to do every day. You know, from the mundane to the very sort of everyday to-do lists to conceptual things that, that I've been thinking about for years and how to uh, document that. Um, I also have like very simple, boring things I do every day and like going for a walk every day, right? Make sure I go outside. And I think of nature as sort of the ultimate metaphor because um, when you go outside, you actually engage all your senses and not just your five senses of sight, smell, sound, touch, and taste, but your the senses of um, you know, proprioception, yourself in space, uh, neuroception, feeling safe or not, um, entero and interoception, which is awareness of your body and its functions inside, as well as how it responds on the outside. All these senses are engaged and in many ways, nature is sort of the opposite of our online lives, right? Everything is slow in nature. Nothing is fast. Everything grows at an imperceptible rate and yet everything is moving, everything is alive. So to me, nature is a tremendously sort of restorative um, experience. Um, also making sure there's times when you're doing nothing. So just sort of laying about and uh, um, letting your mind rest, letting your mind wander. All these are essential. Like rest is essential to creative practice and creative functioning. So if you, you know, uh, make sure you have periods of rest, um, both physical rest as in sleep, as well as mental rest as in you're not focused on something, you're letting your mind wander. Um, I try to kind of pack in all that and make sure that every day there's, yes, I have commitments and people to take care of and students and family and uh, colleagues and all that, which I'm very grateful for and love, but I also need time by myself and to just kind of process and making sure I have that, um, pockets of that. So a combination of things. Awesome. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And then, um, can I ask if you have any tips or pieces of advice for people who are interested in going into art therapy, if you would, mm -hmm. um, like have any words of encouragement or kind of advice as to what they should start doing now to kind of determine if that's what they want to do or how they could like interact with patients and that kind of thing? Yeah. So I think um, it, and this is something you have to decide, right? So it's definitely not a well-known profession. So you'll spend a lot of time explaining to people what you do. Um, and that's, that's an occupational hazard. I accept because I love what I do, right? I could, I could do something that's well known, uh, but I know it'll not fill my soul. So this is something I love to do because I know personally, you know, artistic practice has helped keep me sane and keep me kind of um, functioning. Um, so it definitely helps if you come from that experience. So, you know, art therapy, music therapy, dance movement therapy, um, for all these uh, credentials, these are master's level credentials, you need to have expertise in some art form, right? So you cannot facilitate self-expression in others if you don't have some proficiency in it yourself. So, you know, explore whether or acknowledge whether you have expertise in these things. Um, and two, are you really interested in human health and well-being? Are you interested in human psychology? Um, are you interested in what makes people thrive? Um, what people struggle with? Are you someone who is interested in people's stories? Um, are you interested in um, how uh, someone uh, gets better over time or what are the things that affect them that make them function worse? Um, it's not, um, I wouldn't say it's a very high paying profession, but it's a very gratifying profession. So um, the pay is, pay is getting better over time and there's more and more recognition um, of it. Um, so if you are someone who understands and values uh, creative expression and sees its value for human functioning, I would say go for it. Um, you would love it. Awesome. 
And then I'm wondering if you've um, kind of touched on some of the research that you do a little bit. Could you kind mm -hmm. of talk about just an interesting concept in art therapy and kind of explain it, you know? Um, I'm, I personally am really interested in like um, neuroplasticity and how our brain changes in response to our environment and uh, to like the activities that we engage in in everyday life. And so I'm just wondering if you could kind of talk about um, like different things that you've um, seen in your research from even like a biological perspective or from just interesting findings. Okay, so, you know, it's funny you said neuroplasticity because I just tweeted about it today morning. And uh, <laughs> what I said was, and I realized that neuroplasticity is literally the manifestation of hope. Interesting. It's the manifestation of the idea that we can change and there is always potential for change and potential for something new. So if we didn't have that embedded in our wiring, I don't think neuroplasticity would exist. So to me, it really represents hopefulness and some um, a positive turn. Now it could go either ways. It could go, you know, um, in the in the realm of trauma and despair. But uh, I like to think that it represents hope and positivity. Um, another interesting concept uh, that I like to share is the idea of sublimation. So what our therapy helps you do is channel what might be destructive impulses, destructive emotions into an adaptive form of expression. So instead of uh, punching someone, maybe you take a pile of clay and punch that into something, right? Um, if you are someone who's struggling with aggressive emotions, get into woodworking, you know? Channel all that energy and rage you feel into creating something of value and of beauty in the world, right? Um, not everything that is negative or destructive needs to manifest in the same way. So sublimation is this idea that you channel something distressing and difficult and morph it into something that's adaptive and can give uh, a sense of joy. And even if it doesn't, you channel your destructive um, instincts or impulses into something that is not necessarily long-term destructive, right? So you might feel rage or anger, I don't know, go, uh, go dance it out or um, go yell it out, right? Or go sing it out instead of um, hurting someone you love or hurting someone um, in your life that um, you don't want to lose. So that to me is a really important idea, this channeling of um, the range of human emotions and processing it in effective ways. Um, it's actually counterproductive to suppress or uh, hold back uh, negative emotions, right? Like there's a lot of this positive psychology stuff and um, I actually think there's a lot of power to negative thinking, right? So just acknowledging that we have a range of experiences and emotions and that there are ways to express and channel that, I think is terribly liberating. So you don't have to kind of repress things um, which are part of normal human functioning. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's great. And then... Um... In the first part of this podcast interview, Dr. Kamal started out as a designer and then transitioned to art therapy. She also mentioned that it's important to connect with the arts that we enjoyed at a young age, regardless of how good we are at them. She mentions that it is important to have both physical and mental rest. Taking a walk, connecting with nature, and spending time by yourself can be healing. Sublimation is the idea that you take something negative and difficult and turn it into something positive or helpful. She also mentions that you cannot facilitate self-expression in others if you cannot do this yourself. It is important to have an interest in both the human experience and art for going into art therapy. Lastly, Dr. Kamal mentions that neuroplasticity is the manifestation of hope or, in other words, of the idea that we can change. I'm wondering if you can kind of 
give us a glimpse into the life of an art therapist and what you do and that kind of thing, just um, mm -hmm. for people that uh, maybe haven't heard of it before, or people that are interested in going into it and aren't sure exactly what it all is like involves. Mm -hmm. So could you kind of give us a kind of glimpse into that? Yeah, so it really depends on where you work and how you work. So art therapists work in a range of settings. They might work in hospitals, they might work in clinics, they might work in private practice, they might work in schools, they might work in community health settings, range of places, right? So depending on where you work, your um, day is shaped by that. So say you're working in a inpatient hospital setting, you might come in um, and you might see patients uh, at their bedside throughout the day. You might have a mobile art cart that you take with you. Uh, if you're working in an outpatient setting, you might uh, see patients who come in at scheduled times. Um, you might um, maybe have a space which is like a community studio space where people come and drop in. Um, and work while they are waiting for their appointments or as part of their treatment that they get care. Um, art therapists also work in nursing homes and elder care settings. So over there, they might be going in and uh, coordinating group activities and group sessions, um, depending on patient needs and um, functioning, right? So to what extent is someone able to physically work with the materials? Those are the kinds of decisions our therapists make all the time. Uh, and this is why you need to know your art materials really well, right? Who will benefit from which um, art media? Who can work with which art media? Um, how can I structure the space and the sessions so that you feel a sense of accomplishment and um, uh, self-expression that feels right to you. Those are the kinds of things and kinds of decisions our therapists are making all the time. Um, how can I make this experience meaningful and personally um, developmental for you, right? Um, if in my case, um, I do a lot of research. So my day is a combination of um, uh, following up on different pr research projects, looking at uh, the work that has been done, a lot of writing every day, a lot of reviewing and critiquing um, every day, uh, mentoring my students, my research assistants, um, connecting with collaborators at different sites. Um, all these are part of my day. Uh, some of my colleagues who teach, um, they teach several courses and um, they have a combination of sort of uh, teaching days as well as mentoring and reviewing uh, students. Um, some of my colleagues who work in schools, and I worked in schools too um, many years ago, um, it's connecting with other school professionals, serving the needs of students, you know, either in class or in, um, you know, depending on whether if they have a individualized education plan. So, you know, working with special needs students, perhaps, um, or if, with a group of students, it really um, varies. Some of my uh, colleagues who work at um, military bases, they might see several service members throughout the day in a series of individual as, a, as well as group sessions. Um, so really depends on the um, type of setting, but, um, it's, you know, it's a combination of um, working with people and um, managing the space and the art materials and also managing yourself. You know, if you're, when you're constantly listening to um, uh, and helping people, it's very easy to get burned out and it's very easy to kind of deprioritize yourself. So that's one thing. I emphasize to my students, my colleagues, and something I have to remind myself too that, you know, while caring for others, we also have to kind of care for ourselves. So balancing that. Um, when I was just starting out in art therapy, <laughs> my, my husband used to uh, joke that, you know, I was nice to the rest of the world and I came home and yelled at everybody. So yeah. that's, you know, like, and, and my kids have said that to me too. That, when I when I've yelled at them, they're like, "Mommy, did you have a bad day?" And I'm like, "That's not right. <laughs> I can't. I can't like you know take it out on my family. So yeah. I have to. I have to be mindful of that. 
Yeah, I, I um, definitely think that it can be a difficult balance to achieve because, mm-hmm. you know, you, you want to give so much of your energy to the people around you. And, and sometimes it ends up kind of turning on you where you're giving a lot of energy to people like, like that aren't necessarily related to you. And then you come home mm-hmm. and you aren't treating the people that are like really caring for you and related to you in the way that they deserve to be treated because you've just given so much of your energy out. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lesson for all of us, you know, and uh, when do you sort of dial down and take care of yourself? Right. Yep, absolutely. Good point. And then, um, so uh, where do you kind of see the field of art therapy going in the future? Like in the next, I don't know, like five to 10 years, where do you think it's kind of going to develop? in what ways? That's a great question. And I think my answer would have been very different a year ago compared to now. I think um, (laughs) COVID has really uh, highlighted the value of um, telehealth technologies, right? So um, if you had asked art therapists even a year and a half ago whether things can go online many of them would have said no no this human thing is really important and i would agree i think there's very um, major limitations to this kind of interaction um you know even now you and i we are like little rectangles um on a screen you know it would be very different if we were sitting together in the same room and communicating right um so there's value to that but in the absence of that, there's also a lot of value to uh, being able to support and help each other um, using online technologies. So uh, it saves time commuting. You know, someone has difficulty um, with physically traveling to a therapist's office. I think this allows it. Um, time, resources, all those are considerations. So I think the future will have many more telehealth options, um, many more uh, digital drawing tools. So as some of what we do, uh, we do work with virtual reality as a um, as an expressive tool. So I see more of that coming up. How can people um, um, explore and express themselves using uh, virtual digital tools? I see more and more of that. And paradoxically, I think while we are online a lot more, there's a recognition of the need to, you know, experience things tangibly. So the example I had of nature was that very thing, you know, um, you go away from this instant gratification online world to uh, a reminder of where we came from, right? And another aspect of nature is that the trees outside, they've existed probably for longer than we have you know they represent time in an entirely different way it's a reminder like here we are on this continuum of time and space um and we are part of this universe in ways that um technology um, might not capture because it's a fairly recent development so I, I see us exploring these kind of uh, combinations of digital and real-time uh, forms of self-expression. Um, I see more and more recognition. And that's the other thing COVID did. You know, last year I did a series of like interviews and webinars and the role of art in our lives. And um, one of the things that really emerged is that people are valuing Um, creative outlets you know what do you do when you're shut down and you're sitting at home how do you cope with distress and um, yes science will get us out of it with the vaccines and knowledge and but art will help you cope in the moment right so uh, um, this author Mo Willems had said that science will get you through but science will get you out but art will get you through Um, so you know feelings of isolation loneliness distress these are not new. These are age old emotions. These are age old experiences. And um, to see that in art and poetry and music and dance is a reminder that we're not alone. You know, this is, yes, it's a new situation, 
but um, go back in time, you know, 1918, the flu um, pandemic, Spanish flu pandemic occurred. None of this is new. We just need ways to figure out and recognize that um, our ways of coping might evolve, our ways of responding might change, but we have the capacity to do it. So um, it's a reminder of what the arts can do to help us regulate ourselves and manage us, ourselves better. Awesome, thank you. And um, kind of transitioning a little bit, but kind of going off that at the same time. So <laughs> I'm wondering how art therapy can be used to connect people across different cultures and that kind of thing, because um, I think there is like a lot of division in the world um, at times. And so I'm just wondering how like art can be used to kind of connect us all. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. You know, um, think about music or dance that we enjoy from around the world or visual art forms and uh, that we enjoy from around the world. Um, there's definitely personal preference, right? Some things um, we like more than others. Um, I know my artistic expression is defined by where I grew up, you know, things I've seen, places I've traveled to, the languages I speak. So what I'm exposed to shapes what I'm, what I like and how I create. So there's that piece of it. But what I think um, some truly universal pieces of art provide is a reminder of our shared humanity. Okay. And my favorite example of that is um, artwork by Vincent van Gogh, who, um, who I think sold only one piece of art in his lifetime. But he, his gift, I think, to humanity is the representation of, or his ability to represent what he was going through in his brush strokes, in his imagery. And he was one of the first artists to really represent everyday life, not the life of nobility, not the life of you know, royalty or rich people, but the potato farmer, right? Um, so he really, in my mind, transformed the idea of art as being this um, sort of distant, sacred, um, practice, not that it's not sacred, I think it absolutely is, but that it's accessible to anyone, right? So uh, you don't have to be uh, extensively trained, you can teach yourself, you can engage in things you love to do, and keep working on your craft, keep working to uh, improve that. And now the Van Gogh Museum has a waiting list, you can't just show up and walk into the museum, you have to book days in advance. Um, and what did that do? He basically captured for humanity that which is similar. Right? Um, I feel this way about poetry too. You know, some poetry makes sense across space and time, not even like the same generation. Like, you know, some poetry from hundreds of years ago are so meaningful even now because the human condition hasn't changed. Um, I also feel it's a perhaps the contribution of art is that there's, it's metaphorical, right? So it represents ideas, but not in a literal way. You can project onto it whatever meaning you want to draw from it. So in that sense, it allows for possibility and ambiguity and um, understanding in ways that say, I said something to you in words, it has a literal meaning. And I think this is some of the challenge with things like social media, where you say something and then someone gets upset and then it goes off onto a whole tangent because people are really looking at things very literally. And um, if you step away a little bit and you offer a more metaphorical perspective, I think that allows for more conversation and many different ways um, to connect. So this is definitely a need and I, I hope we see more of that in the future? It's a great question. It's really, uh, I'm going to think about it some more. And then, um, 
So I kind of want to go back to where we were talking about neuroplasticity. Um, mm -hmm. Could you kind of explain what that is for the people listening um, that may not know, have maybe they've never heard of it previously? Yeah, so neuroplasticity is this idea um, that our brains are constantly evolving and open to change. So um, uh, you might have heard the quote, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. Um, you might have heard that um, neuro, uh, neural development um, happens significantly in childhood and adolescent years, but not after that. Not true. Um, yes, a lot of uh, neural pruning and fine tuning happens in childhood and adolescence, but it continues through adulthood because what the brain needs to do on a daily basis is keep you alive, right? And how does it keep you alive? It's constantly making decisions about what you should and shouldn't be doing from the mundane, like, okay, what is the weather and what, you, what should you wear to what do I need to do today in order to be successful and fulfilled tomorrow, right? So what do I need to study? What kind of work do I need to do? Um, how should I care for people in my life? Um, all these are decisions that the brain is making constantly. So neuroplasticity is the flexibility of the brain to adapt, learn new skills, um, ideally change your mind as new information comes to you <laughs> um, and be flexible, be adaptive to adversity that you know is coming at you, right? Life is full of problems and adversities coming at us. And so our ad ability to adapt to those is um, what neuroplasticity, I believe, is all about. So think about, you know, say you... Um, um, I don't know, you hurt your hand and you're a right-handed person and suddenly you have to work with your left hand. Yes, your left hand might not be as uh, skilled as your right hand, but neuroplasticity is what allows you to function with your left hand and maybe even get better over time while your right hand heals. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. And then um, I know that you mentioned some different art forms already, such as uh, like poetry, there's drawing, painting, music, and all of these things. But I'm wondering if there are certain art forms that people don't necessarily always consider art forms. Um, one that comes to mind are like the culinary arts. We don't always group that in with like drawing and painting and all of these things. And so I'm I'm wondering if you know, there are certain ones that kind of come to mind for you that you could kind of mention that would encourage people that even though you maybe you don't enjoy drawing or painting as much, but you know, you can cook, you can bake, you can do all of these different things. Yeah, culinary arts is actually my favorite example because it's one of the few art forms that uses all your senses. So even though, you know, my inclination is towards the visual arts. I also like to dance. Um, I'm not much of a musician, but uh, culinary, definitely. The other is a horticulture. So um, gardening, um, um, changing natural spaces or working with natural spaces. Um, I think that is an underrepresented. There's, there's a whole field of hort horticultural therapy um, so working in nature as a form of uh, therapeutic practice and healthful practice. Um, what else? This is, I mean, I, I don't think of, and this is a dividing line, but I actually think of sports as um, a form of creative practice as well, especially if you engage in it regularly, you know, um, and it's a, it's a form of fitness, but it's also a form of creative practice because you're learning ways to negotiate how to work with an opposing team, um, strategize on how to you know score a point. Um, so I, I do think there's a, a, an entry point for sports related activities um, that can also be considered creative. And then, um... Do you have 
any resources that you could share for like art therapy for both people that maybe are interested in engaging with it and people that want to kind of maybe go into that as a career um, for both ends? Yeah, so I would say go check out the American Art Therapy Association website, www.arttherapy.org. Um, art therapy is A R T T H E R A P Y.org. Uh, there's a lot of resources um, around education, around uh, publications you can read. Uh, testimonials, blog posts, information about different um, settings and specializations. Um, there's um, there's a bunch of papers and uh, materials on my website. I can share that with you as well. Uh, you can check that out. Okay, great. And then, um, so just one more thing to close out um, would be if you have kind of any last words of encouragement, inspiration, or interesting concepts in art therapy that you think people would be interested in to kind of just like a nice ending? No, <laughs> I would say, and this is what I say to uh, patients, clients, and participants in our study is just free yourself from the expectation of um, creating a masterpiece every time you start to do something, right? So free yourself from that expectation. There is no right or wrong. There is no right or wrong in art. It's all exploration. It's all discovery. And I would say approach creative expression as a journey of discovery and joy. Um, learning about yourself, learning about those around you and um, as a way to invest in yourself. So sometimes you might engage in artistic practice as a meditative practice, right? So you might be doing something that's repetitive, but helps you focus, helps you uh, manage your attention. There's value in that. Sometimes you might create something for someone else, uh, making a card, making a gift. It's a way of giving. Um, or you might just make something for yourself, just to process and make sense of something you're experiencing it's all good. So I would say, um, don't hold back, regardless of what you create, there's value to creating, there's value to making. Um, it might be for someone else, it might be for yourself. But to engage in art making is to practice imagination. And uh, practicing imagination will serve you well in life, because you have to negotiate problems all the time. And the more imaginative you can be, the better you can um, problem solve. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining me today and being willing to come on and speak about your experiences and um, just the inspiration and encouragement that you offer to all of us. Oh, thank you. It was so fun to talk with you. You're making me think about all sorts of things. So I'm going <laughs> to awesome. reflect I'm on gonna... that. I'm re going to reflect on your questions. They were such great questions. Thank you. Oh. Yes, of course. And thank you. And um, have a nice day also. Thank you. In the last part of this podcast interview, Dr. Camo told us that art therapists work in many different settings, which shapes the responsibilities. Art therapists work in hospitals, nursing homes, schools, and other areas. Art therapists also make many important decisions related to accommodating patient needs. She also mentions that while caring for others, it is important to care for ourselves so that we can replenish our energy. Some truly universal pieces of art provide a reminder of our humanity. They represent everyday life and connect us through shared experiences. Lastly, Dr. Camel mentions that horticulture, which is um, an example of working with natural spaces or gardening, the culinary arts, and sports can be considered forms of therapeutic and creative practice. Thank you for watching the fourth episode of the Doc Talk with Liz podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe for future videos. Please follow our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for future updates.